God tonight. Our scripture will come from Psalm number 147, verses 5 through 7. And that's 5 through 7, 8. That's Psalm 147, verses 5 through 7, 8. And it says, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Verse 7 says, Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to sing a song that's called Mighty is Our God. that you are hiding, higher than everything, everybody. There is none like you, Father God, and we thank you for just being God. We ask you to bless us in your word, that your word will fall on this soil, that lives will be changed, hope will be renewed, strength will be found. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise, allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. So in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus the Christ, we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Thank God for who he is and what he's already done. And we bless his name on tonight. Amen. We're in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. We're in Acts chapter 10 on tonight. We are moving through the book of Acts in chapter 10. Amen. We are there again tonight. We thank everybody for joining us here and being with us live on tonight. Thank you so much. Acts chapter 10 is in the New Testament. It's the 10th chapter of Acts. And on last week, we were in verse 17. So we will go from 17 tonight to the end of the next pericope. Amen. Amen. On last week, we looked at, at verses 17 through verse 23, and tonight we will close out with verse number 30, 
three. So tonight is 24 through 33. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us on tonight. Amen. Well, last week we covered the fact that that Peter was summonsed. He was summonsed to go to Joppa. He was told to go to Joppa, and then he was summonsed again to go to Cornelius' house. He was summonsed to go to Cornelius' house. Let's look at verse 7, Acts chapter 10, verse 7. Let's look at what we're, we're looking to see here tonight. Acts chapter 10, verse number 7 says, <clears throat> Acts chapter 10, verse number 7 says, When you tell, Acts chapter 10, verse number 7, And when the angel spoke to him, had departed, the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants. Cornelius called two of his household servants in a devout soldier from among those who waited continually on him. So Cornelius, a devout man, called his servants, two servants in a devout soldier and told them to go and find Peter and tell Peter to come to my house. Yes? Told him to come in his house. That's the key verse. That's the very key verse. And we need to understand that when God is speaking, God prepares people to receive what he's speaking about. God has a way of preparing people. So when you get to a point where people are coming to you saying God told them something, God ought to be preparing you. Amen? Just like he prepared them, God is able to speak to you also. Many times people come to the conclusion that God is speaking to nobody but them. And they always, God is always speaking to them about somebody else's stuff. But God is the intelligent God. God has intellect. God is not a God of confusion. And I said to you last week, wherever there's confusion, there is the absence of God. The devil is the author of confusion. And therefore, God is not present when there's confusion. So God is intelligent enough to prepare both persons for a meeting. Remember now, Peter was up on the rooftop. While he was up there, he saw a great sheet fall from heaven. Sheet. A great sheet, a vessel with all kinds of animals on there, fell from heaven. Peter says, I have never eaten anything uncommon after the angel said to him, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. He said, I have not eaten anything uncommon or unclean. And the Spirit of God speaks to him and says, Do not call that which is prepared by God common and unclean. That is seen in verses 15 and 16. This was done how many times? Three times. And the object was taken up into heaven again. Sometimes it takes us more than once for God to get our attention. Any witnesses? Has God ever had to speak to you more than one time to get your attention? Here is Peter, and Peter is very, very familiar. He's very familiar with three times. Jesus said to Peter that you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. And as soon as Peter denied Jesus the third time, guess what happened? The rooster crowed. Peter is familiar with three times. Now we see Peter having to be shown this great sheep Three times, spoken to three times, rise Peter, slay and eat. He says, I don't eat anything common or unclean. God says, don't call anything that I prepared unclean or common. Last week, we dealt with the fact that when this vision was over, Peter was perplexed. Peter was left wondering. 
Peter was left with questions. He wanted to know what did these things mean. While Peter is wondering these things, these men that were sent by Cornelius is found asking the question, where does Simon the Tatter lives? Because we know that one Simon the Peter is there. Peter, Simon Peter is there. What is a tanner? <laughs> What's a tanner? Remember Simon the Tanner? What was a tanner? He, tanner means that he wasn't tanned from the sun. Tanner doesn't mean that he was laying in a tanning booth and got tanned. Simon the Tanner, it was an occupation. What is that occupation? Remember now, Peter has called somebody to rise from the dead. And here he is lodging in Simon the Tanner's house. It didn't click too well because Simon the Tanner, the word Tanner means that he's an undertaker. So here it is, Peter then upset the undertaker's income, but he still lodges in Simon the Tanner's household. He's wondering, what does these things mean? And then when we get to verse number 19, while Peter thought on this vision, who shows up? I didn't say what showed up. Who shows up? The Holy Spirit. The Bible said in, in verse number 19, Acts chapter 10, while Peter thought about the vision, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit himself said to him, behold, three men are seeking you, are looking for you. These three men are looking for you. They are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Who's speaking? God, the Holy Spirit is speaking. We need to hear what the Holy Spirit says. And when the Holy Spirit tells us to do something, he will guarantee us that it's going to be all right. The Holy Spirit is speaking. The Holy Spirit says, get up, go downstairs. And when you get downstairs, follow these men, go with these men and don't doubt anything. God has a way of giving us confidence in what he is saying. He says, do not doubt anything, doubting nothing for the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has sent them. Then Peter went down and the men who were, who had been seeking him, who had been sent by Cornelius said, Yes, he says to them, brother, yes, I am he whom you seek. So evidently, Peter had to have some confidence in the Holy Spirit himself. If I came in this room, I said, hey, there are two men, down, there are three men outside. There are two men outside. There are five men outside and they're looking for you. What would you do? Yeah, it's all kinds of questions. Who are those men? Why are they looking for me? Anybody else? Why are you coming with me? How you know they're looking for me? And then you peep out the door and say, I don't know them. But the Holy Spirit says, doubting nothing. The Holy Spirit says, go with them. Go downstairs, get with them, and go with them. And don't doubt anything. Look at God. God prepares the heart of the receiver and God prepares the heart of the giver. Every Wednesday night, every Sunday morning, I'm praying, Lord, prepare, prepare the people. God, prepare the ground. God, prepare me to present to these people. We have to remember that God is so intelligent until he can prepare everybody. In the eight, late 80s and the 90s, women had a bad, that's when women began to get real, real bold when it came to courtship. Women would get real bold and they would walk up to a man in a heartbeat and say, God told me you're going to be my husband. And I remember one, one statement 
And one woman that would to walk up to her brother and she was stuck on this brother, she would not date anybody else. And he was running like a madman. She said, God told me that you're going to be my husband. He said, God didn't tell me that. He moved all the way from Houston, Texas to Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> Over 300 some miles to get away from his woman. She still was saying after his move that God said you're going to be my husband. Don't you know the God we serve is so intelligent until he knows how to prepare both people? That's why I tell young people, you don't have to go out looking, searching, and looking under the rock and looking under the bushes. You get busy for God and let somebody else who's busy for God find you. You get busy and focus on what God is doing, and God is intelligent enough to take somebody from all the way around the world, and y'all show up at the same place, and that's who God wants to be. Now, my question tonight, <laughs> does God have that one single person for you, or does God prepare the character for you? Or is that one single person a has-been that has to be, that got to be the one for you? Hands going up. How many hands I got in the room? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How many hands going up? How does God operate when he prepares somebody or something for you? Okay, he presents it. Okay, or him, or her. But it's not just, hey, here, here it is, unless he specifically says so. But okay. Otherwise, he'll, he'll present something to you and you say, hey, here's a, uh, this is something good. So, Brother Whitlock, are you telling me that if you had never looked at that conference, went, had never gone to that conference? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I know more about it than he does. <laughs> so, Brother Whitlock, you're telling me if you had never gone to school for engineering, never gone to an engineering conference, if you had never seen that little fly in a bowl of milk sitting over there by herself in the middle of all the other milk, you would never have been presented it and you never had would have come in contact with it. That's in my understanding, you're right. Okay, tell me about it specifically. Well, I, I ended up marrying her and not someone else that the Lord could have presented to me. Okay, so is it your belief that God prepares you for a specific person or does God prepare us for a, a person with these specific attributes? A person with those attributes. Okay, so God leaves the choice up to us. Okay, and so you made a choice. And you roped it and you never let it go. <laughs> my, my, my. Sister Davis? Sister Barney? Sister Barney? Barney? Does God prepare that one house for you? And if it doesn't have that one specific thing in the kitchen that you were looking, for which you were looking, do you pass it up? Yes, what? You pass it up. You pass it up. There's one particular lady who goes to this church, has been in this church probably 12 years or so. She had a dream and she saw in her dream some blue chairs. And when she visited the church, she saw the same chair she saw in her dream and she said, this is the place. True story. Does God operate like that? He can. But see, for me, I'm not a dreamer. When I dream, I still wake up and say, Lord, what is going on? So now that same person has promised that, Pastor David, you can't run me from this church. This is what God told me to be. Now the next minute, when we don't get along, that same person says, I'm changing my membership. So the question tonight is, 
Does God have a specific person, a specific place, a specific thing just for you? Or does God give you the opportunity to make a decision and you adjust your will to fit that person or that thing? I got one person to talk. Anybody else want to talk? Okay, if you don't want to talk, I'm going to call on you. So go ahead and talk. How does God do it? How do we get into the, the, the mind of God and how do we get into the will of God? So it's what, like, how does God do it? Well, you sitting over there saying, Lord, send him this way? Say again. God's will is in his word. God's will is in his word. Now, the other part about figuring out the path and the, 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 the way he goes is for you is the hard part for me. Okay, so does God allow us to figure it out or does God present it and this is it and if we miss up on this opportunity, if we miss this opportunity, it's gone. Sometimes. Sometimes. So we can't hold God in a box, right? right? So God works with everybody in a different way, in the way. And many times what we have gone through determines how we view things and view people. What we want out of life determines who we want, what we want, and how we want it. Yes? And therefore, God being the intelligent God that he is, he presents projects to us. And it's our determination to see and to decide whether we're going to deal with it. Because there are some people that got a long checklist. It got to be this, this, this. Got to be Mr. Tall, Dark, and Handsome. And God shows up with Mr. Short, Red, and Rank. Do we pass up Mr. Short, Red, and Wrinkle because he's not Mr. Tall, Dark, and Handsome? Or do we accept Mr. Short, Dark, and Wrinkle and then let Mr. Tall, Dark, and Handsome go on by his business? A lot of people have said, well, he's the only one looking at me or she's the only one looking at me, so why not? Sometimes that's a mistake and sometimes it's not. God allows us, as he is intelligent, he allows us to use our intelligence. Yes? And so when you, we use our intelligence, sometimes we even think we heard from God and we realize that we didn't hear from him. And sometimes when we hear from God, we ignore him, not because we're rebellious, but because we don't think it's God. So therefore, we have to stay in tune with God. When we look at Peter, Peter was in tune with God. The Bible says the Holy Spirit shows up. It says the Spirit in the New King James shows up, talks to Peter, and says, go downstairs, meet these men. Don't doubt anything in verse number 20. And then he says, I have sent them. Who is he? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he has sent them. If there's nowhere else in the Bible that you can identify the Holy Spirit as a person, this is one place you can identify him as a person. Because it can't send anything. That chair cannot send anything. But a person can send somebody. And they said Cornelius. Then they describe Cornelius just the way that the writer of Acts describes Cornelius. Cornelius, a centurion, a captain of the army. Cornelius, a just man, a righteous man. Cornelius, a man who fears God. Cornelius, a man with great reputation that no one can point at him and prove that he is not godly. He has a good reputation and he has a good reputation among all the Jews. It says he has a reputation among the Jewish nation. So the Jews respect him. The Jews honor him. He has a good reputation. And it deals with your legacy. You are painting, drawing, and creating your own legacy. The question tonight is, what will your legacy be? After you dead and gone, will they remember you for what? Will they remember you? 
Will they remember you for, as somebody who was more concerned about how you dressed than concerned about God? Will they remember you as somebody who says, oh, it's sprinkling rain outside. I can't go to church today. Will they remember you as somebody who will push their way even when you're going through stuff on your own? How many will they remember in this room, on this broadcast, they will remember you by pushing your way? Apostle Paul says, press toward the mark of the high calling of God. Push toward the mark. Exert yourself. Make sure that you give it all you have for God. Will they remember you as the one who conformed to the world or will they remember you as the one who transformed the world because you have been transformed by the renewing of your mind? The Holy Spirit says, you go, when you get there, no, you, you need to understand that you should not be doubting and then Cornelius is a just man. Cornelius, and they didn't have to talk about how good of a man Cornelius was. But they were bragging on their boss. They were bragging on their master. They were bragging on the man who had charge over them. They're bragging on him. Can you brag about your boss? Can your employees brag about you as the boss? Can the children brag about you, Sister Davis, and how you treat them and talk to them and instruct them? What would be your legacy? What would they say about you? You see, you can't depend on what people say about you at a funeral because when you're living, they'll lie on you. When you die, they'll lie for you. There are some people that have had a messed up life, but people lying and talking about how good they are. And preachers are the culprits. Preachers try to make every funeral sound like it was a great person. But not in this house. You stand, you talk about Jesus. Open the doors of the church. Go eat fried chicken. Or will it be a funeral where everybody is celebrating the goodness that you have done? Here they celebrate Canadians. Then they go on to say he was divinely instructed by the holy angel. They said we showed up here, Peter, because Cornelius, the holy man, was instructed by the holy angel. And he did what the angel said to He was instructed by the angel to summon you to his house. That's why preachers should never ask to preach. You, you shouldn't ever have to ask to preach. Because when pre people want you to come preach, they invite you to come preach. Teachers should never ask, can I go over here and do it, be the theme speaker? Because if people want you to be the theme speaker, guess what? They look you up. Because you have a good reputation. Because they're confident that you can make it happen. I mean, the load has been lifted from me that I don't have to teach every Bible study, every Sunday school class, every church service. There's a burden lifted. Brother Miles, Brother Whitlock, Sister Davis, I don't even have to show up. And I have the confidence, Brother Whitlock. I have the confidence, Sister Davis, that the doctrine that I believe in, you believe in too. I have the confidence, Brother Miles, that whatever the word of God say, you're going to say it. It's a burden lifted. I don't have to be in the room. I don't have to watch online. I don't have to scrutinize. I don't have to criticize. I just know it's been done. Because they have a reputation of being divinely inspired. And the good thing about it, it does not attack me because they're doing good. Some teachers, some preachers want everybody to believe that they, they're the only one can do it. I mean, it's a joy deep down in my heart that I ain't the only one that can do it. And that's why 
when I do hear them teach and it comes up in my sermon, I don't mind giving them credit for what God has done in them. I don't have to do it. Matter of fact, I'm looking at some more people that I need to do it. Looking for some more people that I need to do it. Because this is a body, Sister David. This is the body, Sister Bernie. And the body is full of members. And every member has something to offer. And not all of us have the same gifts, but if we put our gifts together, I want you to look at a book, a book uh, called The Puzzle, The Puzzle Church, The Puzzle, Puzzle, like putting the puzzle pieces together. Pastor Gerald Dew, Dr. Gerald Dew writes this book. He and I were in class together when Akadame was okie dokie. <laughs> we were in class together. He, he, he used to pass here in Houston. He's gone on to write this little bitty book, but it makes great sense. He talks about how Every member fits together to make the body operate. And he talks about putting the puzzle together. He said, when you put the puzzle together, you start with all the flat pieces. And after you get all the flat pieces in place, then you do the corners. What he's saying is there's a time for everybody's gifts to shine. Don't hold back on your gift. Make sure your gift is utilized in the body. What will your legacy be when you are gone? So he summons Peter to his house. And he summons him because he wanted to hear the word of God from Peter. How many of y'all invited me to the house to eat or invited me to the house to share the word? Somebody ought to invite me to the house to share the word. And then we eat. So it's like we're waiting on that one. <laughs> She's her toes crossed, saying, I hope he didn't start talking about that. <laughs> so so you understand, Cornelius invites Peter to the house for the word. Not for pool. Not for swimming, not for talking, not for fellowship. He invited him to come to his house to share the word. And when these men got there, Peter invites them in and he lodged with them. Now remember, this is not Peter's house. This is Simon the Tanner's house. Then he invited them in. And lost with them. In other words, they fellowship. On the next day, Peter went away with them. Remember, the Holy Spirit says to Peter, go with these men and don't doubt what I'm telling you. Peter invites them in. They stay there for a while. Then on the next day, Peter went away with them and some of the brothers of Joppa accompanied him. So Peter has a lifestyle now that had been dictated to them that, hey, I'm a good guy. I got great character. I love the Lord. I'm a devout man also. Do people see you as a devout person or they see somebody that just shows up on Sunday or Wednesday? Or do they see you as somebody who doesn't show up at all? There are 52 Sundays and 52 Wednesdays in a year. How many do you show up? How many do you miss? How many do you struggle to get there? How often are you late? And if you are late or absent, is it on your accord or somebody else's call? We are writing our legacy. And people think when you say legacy, it's something good. We used to think of a legacy like Walter Payton. We think of a le legacy like, like uh, some great person. A legacy like J.R. Richards. The question is, what will be your legacy? It doesn't have to be good. If you write the story, it's going to be a bad story. If you write it in a bad way. Verse 24. 
Peter messes around and meet Cornelius. And when I say mess around, he didn't accidentally meet him. He went to his house. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and his close friends. Check this out. They call for the man of God to come to a revival at a man's house and he gathered his family members and his friends to come to his house. They called the man of God to come to their house, to his house, and then he called his family members and his close friends to show up because boy, y'all need to come here, this man of God. It says to us that we ought to be inviting folk to church. If this is our house, is this, if this is the Lord's house, is this the place that we come to hear the word? We ought to invite other folk to come to the same place to hear the word. When the last time you invited somebody to your church? Whenever you invite somebody to come, when the last time you invited somebody to come here, your preacher? Well, you said, no, I don't want them to come hear him. Cornelius invites his close friends, his relatives, his family members to come to hear Peter. And then as you continue to read this pericope, you will find out that it was no small affair. The house was packed. I believe in the Bonner survey and report says, if we invite people, they'll come. If we influence people and people that we have influence over, if we invite them, they will come. I always ask people, uh, once I get past the salvation story, what church do you attend? And if they blink, they're not active. If they hesitate, they're thinking of some church. And if they say Lakewood, oh, I'm all over it. Why do I say, when I say Lakewood, when they say Lakewood, why do I say that the conversation goes on and on when they say Lakewood? Because if they go to Lakewood, it's a good thing. But Lakewood is the easiest place in the United States of America for any of us to attend and get lost in the building. So if I tell you I go to Lakewood, guess what? You can't prove that I don't. Because it's 50,000 people between Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So you can't prove it. The fact of the matter is, we need to be inviting people to come and hear the word of God from the man of God. We ought to invite people. Cornelius invited them. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Is that a problem? When Peter was walking in the door, Cornelius had such great respect for him, Cornelius falls down at his feet. And he didn't greet him, he worshiped him. Is that a problem, Sister Byrne? What's the problem? He's a man just like you. People like for people to worship them. God, I pity the person who wants somebody to worship them and don't stop them from worshiping them. And there are people who want people to worship them. They begin to tell lies like this is the biggest crowd that we've ever had. This crowd at the monument is bigger than the civil rights crowd from Martin Luther King. And you can throw a rock in the crowd and hit no one. Because they are so stuck on themselves. They will find anything to make them big and puffed up. Look at what it says. Mr. Barney must have read ahead. Peter says, get up from there. Peter said, yeah, what's your problem? But Peter lifted him up. Peter picked Cornelius up. Now, Cornelius is respecting him, but he went too far because he worshiped him. The Bible said Peter lifted him up. In verse 26, he lifted him up saying, stand up. I myself is also a man. 
We don't worship men. We worship our God. If the president of today were to walk in this room, we all, there would be music playing. There would be secret service in the room. 24 hours before and from that 24 hour period all the way until he leaves, secret service will take over the place. They will be here the whole time, standing inside the wall and talking on their headsets. And when the president walks in, everybody in the room with good sense will stand up. For this president. But if Jesus walked in the room, if the Holy Spirit showed up, we wouldn't stand up. We would have to bow down. Because you honor men, but you worship your God. The Holy Spirit shows up, we ought to bow down, we ought to wave our hand, we ought to clap our hand, we ought to raise our voices. And the Holy Spirit is here now. I've been said to be guilty of raising my voice at the wrong time because it's not homiletically correct and homiletically sound. But I'm not talking about man, I'm talking about God who's the Spirit. God who's the creator. God who's the triune God. God who does all things well. We worship him. We honor him. We give him glory. And sometimes it takes all that is within us to honor him. He's God. If you never ever is excited in your life, you ought to be excited when it comes to worshiping God. Cornelius gets caught up. Cornelius gets caught up. He bows down to the feet of Peter. He worships him. But Peter said, wait a minute. He lifts him up. And he says to him, don't worship me. Stand up. I myself is only a man. I'm a man just like you are. Thank God for men who want respect, but they don't want anybody to worship them. The Bible says, Sarah called Abraham Lord. Let me set some women free tonight. The Bible says Sarah called Abraham Lord. She wasn't calling him Lord like Lord God when she worshiped him. She's calling him Lord because he's her head. Tonight I'm going I'm to go over and put my ear to the window at the Whitlock's house and, mm -hmm. and see if she's going to holler upstairs and say, Lord, your dinner's ready. <laughs> Lord, your your dinner your dinner's ready. He comes downstairs. She said, "Here's your dinner, my lord." The Bible teaches that that's fine, but you don't worship him. You merely respect him. When Paul says the woman ought to submit herself to her husband, respect him. If you want a madman on your hand, make him think that you are disrespecting him. If you want a mad woman on your hand, make her think that you don't love her. Men need respect. Women need love. Women need a lot of things. Love, security, money. What else y'all need? But man, men can live with just respect. Because if she, if he knows that she respects him, he'll tear a wall down just for her. Because when she respects him, she encourages him. So it says that, Peter says, get up from there. He raises him up and says, stand up. I myself as a man don't worship me. Verse 27, Acts chapter 10, 27. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. I told you, it wasn't no small affair. This man, Cornelius, went out in the bushes, in the hedges, in the highways, got his close friends and his family. Even Pookie and them showed up that night. He got his whole family, brought his friends, they showed up, and when Peter walked in, he was amazed that a lot of people had come together. Then Peter got religious on. Look at, look at Peter gets religious. Verse, verse number 28. 
Then he said to them, now y'all know, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one another's nation. You know how, how it is, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go one of another's nation. In other words, here y'all are Gentiles, and I showed up here. Here you all are, you're non-Jews, and I'm present. Don't you know it is unlawful with the Jewish nation that I show up in the middle of y'all, and y'all don't call me over here? He says it's unlawful. It's against the law. I'm all out of place. But look at what he says. He says it's unlawful, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Let's go back. When we look back and we see what God is talking to, to Philip, I mean to Peter, Peter says that I have never eaten anything that's unclean. I have never eaten anything that's common. Verse number 14, Peter says that's unclean and that's common. I told you two weeks ago that it's more than food. It's not about food. It's about race. It's about Jewish and Gentiles not coming together. It's not about food. The, the, the sheep that is let down before Peter, this sheep was not about food. God just used animals to depict the people that Peter's going to meet. Here Peter says, God has shown me that I should not discriminate. Says God has shown me that I should not call anything that God has blessed unclean or uncommon. Therefore, I came without objection. He came without fighting. He came without talking about the Jewish law. He showed up. I came without objection as soon as as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason you sent for me? Peter says, I had a problem. I had a sin problem. The sin problem that I had was a problem that I did not hang out with Gentile. In other words, I was prejudiced. But God showed me. He didn't tell him God had to show me three times. <laughs> But God showed me. And when God showed me that nothing he has blessed is common or unclean, now I'm coming to you without any objection. Now you tell me, verse 19, you tell me why, verse 29, why have you called me here? So Kanija said, four days ago I was fasting. There's the word fasting again. When we, the word fasting means to cover one's mouth. The word fasting means to stop eating food. The word fasting means to top, stop taking in nutrients. You're dependent on God and you want to get close to God. That's why you fast. I was fasting until this hour. I was fasting up to now. And at the ninth hour, he says, four days ago I was fasting and I prayed in my house and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Who do you think that man was? Look at God. God prepares Peter by way of an angel and he prepares Cornelius by way of an angel. And then the Holy Spirit comes and confirms it all. Look at God. He said, I was fasting about the ninth hour. What time was that? What time was he was fasting? And a man showed up. He was fasting that day, but what time did the man show up? A ninth hour, the ninth hour. He was fasting during the ninth hour. Fasting during the ninth hour. There's a clock. What time? <laughs> She's doing sign languages out there. It's like one of these numbers is right. One of, one, one of them is right. So he's fasting during the ninth hour. Remember, Peter was praying during the sixth hour. 
praying on the rooftop. Look back in your Bible in the same chapter. He was praying on the rooftop around the sixth hour. What did we say the sixth hour was? We're talking about the sixth hour. What's the sixth hour? Sixth hour is high noon, right? So it's 12 o'clock. He's praying around the ninth hour. When is the first hour? The first hour is, is 6 a.m. So the sixth hour is 12 noon. What's the... What's the What's the, the, the ninth hour? Three o'clock. It got to be one of them. If I start at 12, 13, 14, 15, it got to be one of them. So he's praying around the ninth hour. He's praying at three o'clock in the afternoon. So he's praying at three o'clock in the afternoon. Remember, Peter is praying at noon. He's praying at noon. They're praying at three o'clock in the he's praying at three o'clock in the afternoon. A man shows up in bright clothing, verse 31, and said, Cornelius, your prayers, remember that? Your prayers have been heard and your arms have been respected or remembered. And they have been heard and remembered in the sight of who? God. When you pray and when you give alms, meaning giving to the poor, if man never hear you pray, if man never see you give, you want God to hear you and you want man to see you. I mean, you want God to see you. You want God to hear you and you want God to see you when you give alms, don't tell anybody about it. Jesus says, when you give, just give it and leave it alone. Don't go bragging about it. That's hypocritical. When you give, you make sure you give and you give with the right motive. And you want God to see it. And guess what? God sees everything. He sees when you don't give. He says, Cornelius says that when I was fasting, and while I was fasting, this man stood before me in bright clothing, and while I was praying, this man says to me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Cornelius, your arms that you've been giving to people have been remembered, and it has come up in the sight and in the presence of God. Verse 32, send therefore to Joppa and call Simon, whose surname is Peter. Call Simon Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon the Tanner. What is his occupation of the Tanner? Somebody tell me that. He's the undertaker. He's hanging out with the undertaker. And this is not the Undertaker from WWE. How many of y'all know the Undertaker from WWE? You got one person that admit they know the Undertaker from WWE. WWE is the, the, the wrestling federation. The Undertaker was this tall guy. Looked like he's about six foot eight. And when they get him on the mat, they would go one, two. You know they always got to get to two, you know. One, two, and while the referee's hands in there, the Undertaker sits straight up. He is symbolizing, <laughs> he is symbolizing that the dead will get up. <laughs> he doesn't bend his knees, he's laying flat on the canvas, and all of a sudden he sits up. The dead has risen. His, his name was the Undertaker. So, so Peter is living in the house, staying in the house, lodging in the house, fellowshipping with the undertaker. So Cornelius saw that Peter was in Simon the Tanner's house, and guess what he says? Simon the Tanner's house over by the sea. I'm telling you, God is better than your GPS. I don't know how many times I'm all, I ended up 20 miles out of the way because of my GPS. But God pinpoints this thing. The Holy Spirit tells, tells Cornelius, go to Simon the Tanner's house by the sea. 
He might as well have said, show up at New Beginning Church at 4251 Shiremai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048 USA. And gave the latitude and the longitude. God is able to find the right latitude and the right longitude. He sends him right to the place where he needs to be. He didn't have to send him around 610. He told him where to go. And when he showed up, guess what? He was right there. He, went in, he didn't end up at the house next door. He ended up at Simon the Tanner's house. God is our GPS. And when he comes, he will speak to you. Check this out. God knowing all things, he knows that Peter is not going to reject him. God tells Cornelius, Simon, Peter will speak to you. He won't avoid you. He won't go the other way. He won't be rejecting of you. He's going to speak to you. I'm telling you, I get excited because we serve the awesome and the amazing God. He knows everything. Matter of fact, he knows who you're with, where you've been, how you've been there, where you go. He knows everything. Now, let me tell you, they're trying to paint a picture now that your GPS knows everything. They're trying to paint a picture now that your air tag knows where you are. They're trying to paint a picture now that AI knows everything. Let me tell you, it's only God and God alone who knows everything. The Bible says he tells him where to go. And when he tells him where to go, he says, whatever you do, when you get there, he's going to speak to you. Just realize God has prepared the way for you. He's going to speak to you. Verse 33. So I said to him immediately. And you have done well to come. Done well to show up. Simon, Simon Peter shows up and Cornelius says, I sent for you and you've done well to come. Whenever God does something, he does it well. Now Peter had all the reason in the world had he been in the flesh. He could have said, look, I ain't dealing with them because not only did the Holy Spirit has to, had to deal with Peter by way of this great sheet, later on we will find out that Paul had to stand against Peter. The Bible said Paul stood him to his face and said, now look, Peter, you're hanging out with the Gentiles, but when the Jews show up, you're going to act like you were never with the Gentiles. It's like a friend because they fall out with somebody, they want you to fall out with them too. Peter didn't want, want the Jews to know he was hanging out with them. So God has to appoint Peter and take him through a process. What process is God taking you through? Is he taking you through something? It's a process. Don't forsake the process. I mean, don't forget the process. There are things that have happened to me that I really, really prefer that they did, but I thank God now for the process. The process. So I sent to, to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before the Lord, before God. We are all present before God. Now we're in the presence of the Lord. You ever heard a preacher say, let's stand for the reading of the word, and when he gets through reading, he says, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Cornelius says to Peter, we are now all in the presence of God. Let me tell you, you, you need to be in God's presence. There is no presence like the presence of God. We are all present before the Lord to hear all the things commanded you by God. So he, he tells the story of how he got Peter there. And then he says, Peter, we're depending on you. On Sunday morning, on Wednesday night, whatever your worship day is, uh, you ought to look for the man of God to give you a word from the Lord. You ought to look to the teacher to, to, to give you what the God that we serve has given you. And he ought not be giving you a Saturday night special. You 
I ought to give you what he studied all week. So Kinesia says, we, we've been waiting. We've been in a position. That's why on Sunday morning, between 10 o'clock and 1030, we ought to be preparing our heart to hear from the Lord. When we have the children up here playing, they playing soft music, we ought to get in tune with God while they're praying. You ought to get your mind focused. The old people back home used to say, bring in every scowling, every scowling stock thought. Bring in every troubled mind. Bring in every rambling heart. We ought to be preparing ourselves to hear from the Lord. Early in the morning when we get up, we ought to be preparing our heart to hear from the Lord. Cornelius said to Simon Peter, we want to hear what the Lord has said to you. That's why when we introduce a preacher on Sunday, he gets up, we want to hear what the Lord has said to this preacher. Preacher, preach what God has said to you. Teacher, teach what God has said to you. Many times we don't know what God is saying because we haven't studied what God has said. And if we studied what God has said, then we would know what God is saying. Jesus died because he wants us to hear what God is saying. And we want to hear. We won't, don't take this moment for granted. Even when the preacher or the teacher is talking about something that you don't want to hear, Hear it all because every sermon and every teaching is not what you want to hear. It's a process. And the process is one that causes us to grow. You just got to go through the process. I mean, sometimes the process is hurtful. Sometimes the process will make you mad. But you got to go through the process. It's the process that prepared me to pastor this church. Woo. It's the process. I couldn't give it away. I couldn't sell it off. I just got to go through the process. And then after 12 years from now, if God said the process is not finished, guess what? I got to continue to go through the process. It's, it's the process where we are blessed and prepared for our future. You never know what God is preparing you. He's preparing you for a greater thing than what you are and where you've been. And how you handle things. God is preparing us. God prepares every single character for what God is going to do in the future. Even Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection was a process for Jesus in order that we can go through the process. If there's no death, there's no resurrection. If there's no death, there's no salvation. You see, everybody like Resurrection Sunday, but we don't want to go through Good Friday. But Jesus did. And he did it for you and me. The door of the church is open. Jesus went through the process for us. And we have to go through the process in order to be made different. If you never received Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. Just simply trust in the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Trust that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. If you've never done that, just bow your head with me and invite Jesus into your life. Just repeat this simple prayer after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for your sins, for our sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, believing the story that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead, we believe that you're born again, you're saved. We believe that you're on your way to heaven. 
And if you're looking for a good church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Where Jesus is the captain of the ship. If you've received Jesus Christ as your savior tonight or you need a church home, inbox us and let us know so we can welcome you to this family of faith. Thank you so much for joining us. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. It is offering time. Time to give to the Lord. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Zelle is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your gift to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for these gifts. We ask you to bless every giver and bless every gift in Jesus' name. Amen. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? Praise reports or prayer requests. Any praise reports or prayer requests? We are praying for Derek Woods. We're praying for Jennifer Bell. And we're praying for Sister Lydian Darrington as the, Sister Darrington has just on, undergone surgery, surgery today. So we want to lift her in prayer. We want to lift Derek Woods and Jennifer Bell in prayer also. Amen. Are there any other prayer requests? Let us stand. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for all that you do. Now, Lord, we come lifting these before you. We ask you to bless their lives, heal their bodies. We ask you, Father God, to continue to walk with us. We pray for the Child's family. We pray, Father God, for the, the Ligans family. We ask you to bless them and encourage them even right now. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling, the only living God, God himself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God.